So I have a, a presented disclosure here. Um, the Monell Center receives money from uh, many uh, companies. I'm particularly interested in the issues of uh, public-private partnerships. Um, but none of our staff, including myself, uh, obtain any personal money from any company. Uh, all the work that we do with companies is published uh, and um, we try to maintain a very, very strict uh, rule that uh, we cannot uh, do any uh, work that is not uh, possible to put in the public domain. Some of it, of course, is not worth publishing, uh, but uh, w what, whatever we wish to publish, we have that right. <coughs> so uh, our institute is the first and, and certainly the largest uh, institute that studies uh, the chemical senses. Now, if we think of these five senses that you can see in front of you, vision, hearing, uh, touch, smell, and taste, um, it's uh, widely believed that the first two are the most important ones. And if you look at any textbook about uh, the senses, there's usually 60% uh, vision, 30% hearing, uh, and 10% the lower senses. And it's certainly true, I think, that if you think about what happens when you lose senses, um, it's much, much more serious, much more worrisome, and uh, much awfuler to lose vision or hearing. Uh, than it is the other senses. But my argument is that if you think about the health issues, about how, how senses impact upon our health, then these other three senses are by far more important. Um, and uh, all of you know very well that, that almost every <coughs> um, survey uh, suggests that the taste, so-called taste of food, is the most important uh, factor in food selection. And of course, food uh, plays the central role in many, many diseases. <clears throat> um, so th this is a, uh, a picture from uh, Washington Post magazine cover for quite a few years ago, and really gets to my interest, not so much in obesity, which is not an, an area of my, my expertise, but in the, the uh, question of where we come to like and choose uh, particular uh, sensory experiences. And the, the the roles of the innate and the learned. And, and you see this family here, and all of them look obese, um, and leads one to think that perhaps genes are very, very important in, in uh, food choice and, and uh, uh, overeating. But then you see in the lower left uh, somebody that can't possibly be genetically related to the family, and, and, and that character obviously is also obese. So that suggests that maybe there's a, an environmental impact as well. And my, my interest really is to try to, to, to pull those apart and really not, uh, and to look at their interactions. And so here's a cartoon which you probably can't read uh, from the New Yorker a few years ago, but it talks about uh, is it innate? Uh, is it learned? Is it an interaction between the two? Or the correct answer beats me. And um, so th this, this cartoon really speaks to what I'm going to come to at the end, which is all four of those are correct. Um, so uh, just to have just a little word about the chemical senses, the, the, the sense of flavor, uh, uh, which I consider the, the, pro the proper term for uh, what's generically called taste, uh, is really made up of three absolutely separate and uh, anatomically distinct senses. The sense of taste, which is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami. The sense of smell, which is made up of hundreds, thousands. Most recent estimate is uh, 10 to 100 million different odor. Uh, and then there's the sense of chemesthesis or irritation, which is things like burning of hot peppers, uh, cooling of menthol, things of that sort. So these three things are totally separate anatomically uh, in the front. They have t separate receptor mechanisms, but in the brain, particularly in, 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 in particular areas of the brain, these, this information comes together and our percept of it is a single sensory experience. And this is the sort of thing that you know well when you, when you have a cold, um, you lose your sense of smell and supposedly taste changes. Taste doesn't change, smell changes, but the overall percept uh, has, has changed. So I, I kind of like to divide these senses into the, sort of the good and the bad. And if you think first of smell, um, w w what are good smells for? This is in the context of food, of course. And, and presumably they're to identify uh, uh, nutritious foods, to identify foods you like, and, and possibly to warn you about foods that, that are uh, not good. Uh, the sense of taste, 
uh, is evolved at least in part to, to be the, the real decider, uh, the, the most important thing all of us do every day in terms of, of, of uh, protecting our, our lives is make a decision as to whether to take something into our body or not. And uh, for most of us now, this probably doesn't matter much because everything is sort of okay. But uh, during all of uh, hu uh, evolutionary history, this was a very, very important uh, issue. And so the, the, the good sweet things are sugar, salt, um, perhaps fat, if fat is a taste, we don't really know about that, and certainly umami. The bad things for sure are bitter. Uh, sour is a really puzzling one, and I, I don't really know exactly how that fits into this categorization. And then there's the irritants or chemisthesis, and, and uh, it's thought that this sense evolved as, again, a protection. Plants produced materials that were irritating, that, that caused uh, uh, other animals to find them uh, unattractive and uh, protected the plants. Um, yet, uh, for humans, and it's almost a, 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 a unique human characteristic, uh, we tend to like some ir irritants, and I'll, I'll get back to that uh, toward the end of my talk. <clears throat> so if we think of the good and the bad, one of the principles of uh, psychology, one of the few principles of psychology, I might say, that is absolutely agreed upon is that bad is more important than good, in the sense that um, you can measure bad things easy, more easily. Uh, the bad things play a much stronger role in, in, in how you respond. And it's presumed that this is because they provide an immediate danger, whereas the good is not quite so, uh, quite so immediate. And so if you think about the interactions between these two things, it's pretty easy to change good things into bad. Um, and this is, this is done in, in, in a variety of ways you can imagine that. But the idea of taking something that's, that's, that's inherently bad and making it good is thought to not be so common. And what I'm going to argue today is that perhaps that's wrong and that um, there are certain uh, areas, at least, in food where we can move from something that is inherently bad, that is, we're genetically programmed to dislike this, and yet we can translate it into something that becomes very good. And I think this has important implications for how we think about developing uh, eating habits that are uh, uh, more healthy than perhaps they are right now. So I, wa I want to talk first about a paper that's just come out. This is not a paper that I uh, wrote, although I did write a commentary about it. Uh, but it's one of the most fascinating uh, anthropological studies I've ever seen. This is, a, this is pure anthropology, so there's no data not one number in it in the whole paper. Uh, it's it's a, 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 an, eth an ethnic look at peoples in the Bering uh, uh, Sea area and their dietary history. So just to, this is the, the map of the Bering area. And the, the investigators looked at people both in Alaska and across the straits in, in, the, uh, in what is now Russia. Uh, but when they started the work, which is 20 or 30 years ago, it was the USSR. Uh, and the peoples in this area, of course, have very low, relatively speaking, carbohydrate diets, very high fat and protein, and most of the fat and protein are from uh, fish and marine mammals. And this has been the traditional diet, certainly for thousands of years for these groups. <coughs> so this article was about the nastily rotten. And um, uh, this, is, this is a recipe, uh, which you can see up there, for for one of the diets that uh, these people uh, eat, and this is the traditional food. It's basically taking uh, marine mammals, fish, uh, chopping them up, putting them inside a stomach of, an, of, a, of a moose or something like that, sealing it up, putting it out on the ground, and letting it rot for six months. And uh, then you can see the condiments they have with it, which are also pretty attractive sounding. And th this material then is, has been the traditional diet for these people for, for thousands of years. And it's highly desirable and really, really pleasant to them. So this, I have a couple of photographs from this uh, uh, paper. Uh, here's pr preparing uh, one of these uh, uh, bags that they're going to let sit and rot. Uh, this is the place where, where they're allowed to, to, to rot. Um, here's people. Ch uh, preparing dinner uh, or getting the, the dinner uh, from outside and chopping up uh, what, what they're calling a roulade here, which is really just meat wrapped around fish, wrapped around uh, a few other things, and has been rotted for, for six months. Uh, here's the family inside preparing it. And I don't know whether you can 
pay particular attention to the man uh, on the right uh, and notice that he's wearing gloves. Uh, now these gloves are not to protect him against uh, any sort of poison. What they're there for is this stuff smells so bad that he doesn't want to get it on his hands. And um, the, the peoples in, the, in these areas, uh, everything about them smells of, of this particular uh, food. And um, the, the, the next picture shows the same woman. And uh, this is after she's been eating it. Uh, and she's, uh, the, although it's, this is what they say, at least this picture illustrates, is that she's now sniffing her fingers because she's getting even more of the smell that, that she loves so much. Um, so wh 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 what about this? Well, um, th this, 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 the, the, the anthropologists that go to this, this area, when they enter the people's houses that, that are still consuming the traditional diets, uh, the whole house, the whole, everybody, uh, the person reeks of this odor. Um, there's an interesting principle in olfaction that if you are exposed to odor for a long period of time, you don't smell it anymore, so they don't notice it. Uh, but anybody else that goes in absolutely notices it. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, these odors are, are really, really powerful in the sense that they're, they're apparently innately unpleasant. Um, as far as we know, uh, and I'll get to some real data about this, uh, it's impossible, the, the response to these, these odors is not a learned response, but that we find them inherently unpleasant. Um, the, 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 they, they, um, uh, they, they leave a, a sensation of, of powerful distaste. Uh, the people that, 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 uh, uh, that try to, uh, try to um, consume these foods, if they're not exposed to them early in life, tend to literally be unable to. And there was a nice description of an anthropologist coming in to eat the food with the people. And of course, anthropologists are the sorts that, that have to uh, do what, the, what, what they're, the people that they're working with do, and uh, literally being unable to eat it. Chewing it up uh, and then throwing up. Uh, really, really bad stuff. Um, the, 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 the people, though, that, that are used to it find that, in fact, other foods are not filling. This food, they claim, is filling. Uh, we don't know exactly what that means, but it, what, it, what it really means is that this, these foods, the foods that they've had when they've lived this life uh, from the beginning, are particularly attractive, and that to not have them it, it is a loss. And one of the interesting things about this paper, we talked about how um, in the USSR, when there was a USSR, uh, the, they came in and forbade people uh, to eat these traditional diets. They brought in all sorts of West, so-called Western foods, canned foods, and so a whole generation went by that never ever had this uh, food. And then when the USSR collapsed, uh, there was no longer any food being brought in. They had to go back to their original diets, and many people were on the verge of starvation because there was nothing for them to eat because they could not eat uh, the traditional diet. Um, one other interesting component of this, and this is sort of vaguely relevant to the to our discussions in, in past meetings of, of the importance or the, the possibility we're addicted to certain foods, is that they develop cravings for these foods. Um, uh, so um, I think the, the general point there is you can develop cravings for virtually anything. Um, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit now about some new work in olfaction, which I think can begin to explain what's going on in, the, in, in, in this particular uh, culture, where, uh, again, to, to, to uh, repeat, uh, there's a set of foods that are producing odors that are the flavor components that are innately uh, negative, and yet they come to be positive and can only become to be positive, apparently, if they're exposed to early in life. So to, to talk about that, I have to give a little bit of an overview about uh, smell. Uh, so the olfactory system is the, the, the one at the top there. Um, the, the odor receptors are way up here at the top of your nose. And um, th they are in cilia uh, that, are, that are hanging down into the mucus on the top of your head. And on, on each cilium is a, uh, a specific receptor 
that uh, uses a sort of lock and key mechanism to detect odorants. Um, uh, Axel and Buck in, in 1991 made an unbelievable discovery in our field, uh, and that was that there were not just a few smell receptors that responded to many different odorants, but there were hundreds and in some species, thousands. And this is the human uh, sort of picture of olfactory receptors. It, it, humans have about 350 that are functional. Uh, uh, mice and rats have 1,000, 1,200. It's recently been reported that elephants have 2,000 receptors. Uh, more than 1% of our genome is devoted to our sense of smell, uh, a remarkable uh, uh, fact. Um, humans obviously have lost some relative to uh, uh, other species, but we still have a remarkable range of receptors that are able to detect many, many different odors. Um, so this is the sort of the pathway for that. Uh, the top left uh, shows the, uh, the, 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 the cilia and, and the receptor cells. Uh, the pathway then is to the olfactory bulb, the first stage in, in the brain, and then back into the particularly uh, important areas of uh, emotion uh, where the olfactory system goes. And so if we think of uh, the smell of a rose, say you could think of it as being made up of two odorants, uh, what happens is those odorants interact with specific receptors, which then go to specific uh, parts of the brain called the glomeruli that uh, then are organized to send that message back to the brain to tell, to tell the person that this is, uh, the, this is uh, a, the smell of, of rose. Now, very recently, there's been a new set of receptors identified, uh, a very smaller set, a subset, that are quite similar to the olfactory receptors, but are called the trace amine receptors. So these are, uh, in, in humans, there's about six of them. Uh, in, in rats, I think there's nine. Um, but these, these are very specific to the kinds of odors that presumably are those from the rotting fish. And, um, uh, as I say, there's, there's, there's uh, six. Uh, some of these receptors are very specific to a single amine. Others are uh, much more broadly tuned and, 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 and respond to, to several amines. Um, and uh, these, of course, amines, as I'm sure almost everybody knows, are described as very, very bad odors. So here's, here's somebody smelling one of those. And I happen to have brought some with me. I had thought about doing a smell-o talk. Um, but these odors are not something that would be very good to, uh, to, to, to have in the room. But if anybody wants to smell some of them afterwards, I've, I've got them uh, r carefully wrapped up in two or three uh, wrappers. Um, uh, th this person now, by the way, is a uh, uh, public defense attorney in the Bronx. Um, so here's one of them. Uh, this, is, this is the odor cadaverine. Uh, the, the, the name tells it all. Um, this is one of the most powerful, potent, and unpleasant odors. Uh, it is breakdown of amino acids. Uh, and um, although these, uh, the investigators uh, uh, that I talked about did not do chemical analyses of the food, uh, I think it's a, almost a sure bet that this is one of the odors that's there. Another point I want to make is I've got the LD50 here. This is not a dangerous compound to consume. Um, it may be signals danger. And the theory might be that the signal uh, is we learn, we, we, we've, we've developed a, uh, an innate negative response to the signal because it tells us something that this might be dangerous. Um, and, uh, uh, but the signal itself is not dangerous, very different than bitter taste, where the bitter compound is both the signal and the danger. Here's another one, trimethylamine. This is a breakdown product of fish. Also, a very, very unpleasant odor. So, the, 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 presumably, the, the flavor, the odor component of the, these diets is made up of this wide <laughs> set of odorants that are inherently uh, negative. So, um, many of us in the field then want to know how, how these odors are, how, how these receptors are tuned. How, what do they respond to? So, this shows one of the tires. This is actually from a, from a uh, mouse, uh, and it responds to the two odorants that I've showed you. So it's it's a it, it's a receptor that's able to detect these two odorants. But if I show you one, actually that des detects only one, you can see that it very specific. Many many compounds don't don't uh, interact with this receptor, but this particular one does. So um, basically, uh, the argument here is that these trace amine receptors are there to detect. Uh, um, 
products or, or, or uh, of, of, of putrefaction, uh, and that these products of putrefaction in throughout evolution uh, could could in fact be very dangerous. But uh, what I'm going to going to argue is that. Uh, th that although we may be built, and other organisms may be built, to reject these based on, on just their sensory qualities, in fact, we're also built as omnivorous animals to be able to overcome that. And we can particularly be able to overcome that if, in fact, we are exposed to these odors uh, during early life, because that would be a time that, that presumably our, our, our caregivers and mothers are, in fact, exposed to them. And if they're eating them, they must be okay. Uh, otherwise, the, the baby wouldn't exist. And therefore, this is the, this is the period when there's a, a potential for imprinting on, uh, on things that maybe are inherently negative, but can be tr uh, shifted into things that are inherently uh, 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 positive. So basically, what, what, what this says that uh, what, what I'm hypothesizing, and I really don't have evidence for this, this is just my, my uh, deduction from this study, is that, that the, these odors uh, are, are, are innately unpleasant, but they can be turned into something pleasant later in life. Now, um, th there is some experimental work that I have been doing uh, over many years, uh, particularly with my uh, collaborator and colleague, uh, Julie Manella, and of course, I, I repeat what everybody says like me, that uh, in fact, I haven't done any of it. Julie's done it all. But I have been involved in, in, in it. And, and uh, I think there's a parallel that we have some real experimental data showing how this might happen. So um, it's well known that flavors, the, again, odors, that are consumed by the mother, a mother of many species, get into milk, get into amniotic fluid, and that these can be detected and influence uh, later behavior. Um, and so what, uh, what we've shown is in, for humans, uh, flavor, th this list of flavors can be detected in human milk. And one of the really more interesting ones here is the bottom one, cigarette odors. Um, if, if a woman uh, who is uh, smoking cigarettes is given uh, uh, a cigarette to smoke and we collect her milk, about 30 minutes after she smoked that cigarette, her milk smells like a, kind of an old ashtray. Uh, it's a very, very strong odor. Uh, it's, it's a powerful effect, and of course, this is an interesting thing because their infants are being exposed to the flavors of cigarettes uh, very, very early in life. <coughs> uh, we did one study where we looked at the exposure to the odor of carrots, uh, and there's three groups there. One group was exposed to carrots uh, during uh, um, the last trimester of, of their pregnancy. A second group was exposed to the carrot flavor during the first few uh, um, months of life, and a third group was not exposed at all. And I'm not going to show you the data on this, but basically what was found was that both prenatal and postnatal exposure led to children who had a very strong, much stronger positive response to the flavor of carrots when they were weaned. Uh, and to me, these are the, among the best data demonstrating a prenatal learning going on about flavor and the fact that these two two periods in life uh, during all of human evolution, you were exposed to a variety of what the mother was consuming leads to changes in, in acceptance of foods. But the, the, the really nice experimental work could be done with this material. Uh, I think there's nobody here from Mead Johnson, so I, I can say that this is one of the worst tasting uh, foods in the world. Um, this is a, a hydrolyzed uh, casein formula. Uh, they've been working hard to make it better, but in fact, it just is, is awful. And part of the awfulness uh, is in its smell. Um, and it's a retronasal smell that I get, at least. Uh, we are working on trying to understand what the, what the molecules are there. Um, perhaps Mead Johnson knows, but I don't know what the, what the negative uh, compounds are. But they may well be uh, uh, substances that stimulate these trace immune receptors. So uh, years ago, we... we we did a study, and this is a little hard to describe. This is the only data slide that has any problem. Uh, so I would go over it uh, so at least you, you get an idea of it. Along the base is age of the infant. Each dot represents a single baby. Each baby was given uh, uh, two choices. First, a choice with uh, this casein hydrolysate formula. Then next, a choice with regular formula. These are all formula-fed infants. Um, of course, the order was reversed in other, uh, other children. And so if, if they consume equal amounts of regular formula and this awful formula, 
uh, the dot would fall on 0 0.50. And what you see I mean, very clearly is that very, for very young infants, they, they almost all are uh, around 0.5. That is, infants less than four months of age Although we know they can smell, we, we know they have the ability to detect, we don't know whether these trace amine receptors are working, but we know they have the ability to detect smells, but they don't seem to care. Uh, and in fact, they seem to be able to uh, and willing to consume these, these very bad formulas. But those infants that are tested first, each infant was tested only once, so this is not a group of infants tested across periods, but each infant was tested only once. Those that were tested later, as you can see, find that very offensive. It's down near zero, which means that they consume lots of the regular formula, but they refuse to consume uh, the formula that is this hydrolyzed uh, casein. Um, so the hypothesis is that um, based on clinical impressions, that if you feed these babies this odor early in life, uh, this flavor of uh, food uh, uh, early in life, they will continue to like it forever. The hypothesis is that much like what I think is happening with the, the, the people in the uh, uh, Alaska and Russia, that, that they're, when they're exposed to these early, early in life, they will learn to like them, overcome what is inherently negative, and that this will last uh, for a very long time, perhaps forever. Um, uh, these are a little bit of data showing uh, an experiment where we did that. Uh, the, 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 the bars represent um, uh, how much of this, this very unpleasant formula infants consume. Uh, the, the, the one on your right uh, is infants that are fed the bad formula for uh, the first seven months of life. The one on the far left is infants that are never fed the formula. And this just demonstrates that if we look across time, we can show this difference between early feeding and uh, later feeding. So this is sort of the, the pathway that, that Julie and I came up with, where you have uh, uh, the importance of in utero exposure, that, uh, uh, that when babies are, 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 are fetuses are, are being exposed to amniotic fluid, it's not just a constant uh, uh, bath of, of water and salts, it's actually a flavorful mixture. Uh, similarly, hu in human milk, and so the the evolution of, of using formulas is, is very very new uh, in human history, uh, and, and so the typical thing was to go through this 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 uh, movement from exposure in utero to during the first few months of life, uh, and then uh, weaning foods and so forth. And the argument is that the infant is learning what the mothers are consuming, and that is the best evidence, the the the, the best reason to think that um, this food should be okay. And it allows, I believe, perhaps, and this is, needs to be tested, this is what I hope to be doing uh, in my next life, uh, it, it allows the, the overcoming of this innate rejection, which may be uh, uh, useful, uh, because if the mother's not eating it, it may be because there, there, is, there is danger. Uh, and one point that I didn't make is, is the, um, in the modern, uh, the modern uh, natives, native peoples from that area have begun to try to make this food in simpler ways. And, and, and the result of that has been producing it not out in the typical way which allows oxygen to be there, but uh, under circumstances where botulism uh, can be produced. And in fact, there's the, the amount of botulism is going way up in some of these areas, a very, very dangerous situation. So there's reason to, to, to build an animal to avoid this, but there's also reason, uh, if in fact it's, it's okay, to build an animal that can overcome that avoidance. <coughs> um, so, so going back to my cartoon, uh, I, I, as I said at the beginning, uh, everything is right. Um, uh, obviously, innate things are important. Uh, learning is important, a combination, and of course, we still don't know uh, quite. So how broad is this? Well, here's two of my favorite white powders. And um, I haven't talked about them. Uh, th this is really what um, much of my other research is about. Um, I think that the, the evidence that, that, that early experience has anything to do with how much we like sugar is very, very weak. Um, I, don't, I don't believe there's any strong evidence that, that, that we're addicting children to sweets. We were built that way. And in fact, we're built such that the rule for the newborn baby is the sweeter the better. Um, and uh, if there's any change, it's to move it downwards rather than upwards. Sodium and salt is a very different thing. Uh, I think there's reasonable evidence to suggest that there are effects uh, both at the receptor level and in the brain as on, on how 
uh, salt is perceived based on early exposure. And this is an important area which uh, uh, needs to be uh, studied much more, much more deeply. What about bad things? Um, bitter things, uh, as I was trying to make a distinction, the, the bad odors are signals. The bad taste from bitter, the, 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 the thing itself is the, is, the, is the badness. And so I think, I, although we do come to appreciate uh, and perhaps like bitter things, uh, it's actually very rare. And um, this is a very hard one to overcome. Bitter is uh, uh, really, really a good idea to avoid. And, and so um, to overcome that, uh, it takes a lot. But here's one where uh, it, it really gets interesting, and that's the, the irritants. So as I mentioned, the irritants presumably evolved uh, as a plant-animal interaction where the plants want to protect themselves, the, the animals don't want to get uh, tissue damage and so forth. And yet, half the world refuses to eat food that doesn't have something like this in it. Um, and this is the, the response, and for some reason, somehow, we love it. And one of the most curious uh, things is that this seems to be a almost exclusive human uh, response. Very, very few other species, if, if any, uh, uh, are known to, to like this or even come to like it uh, with exposure. Wh why that is, I have uh, really no idea. Um, my own recent interest I has been in another one that's uh, in extra virgin olive oil. Um, extra virgin olive oil, uh, obviously, as you all know, is healthy. It has a wonderful flavor, wonderful smell. Uh, and it turns out that the very, very best extra virgin olive oil, which I didn't know until a few years ago, also has a very strong sting in the throat. And um, if you take a, a, a random set of people that have not been exposed to extra virgin olive oil, they find this sting to be very unpleasant. And we discovered it by studying, uh, actually, the, the flavor of ibuprofen. I won't describe why we were doing such a thing. But if you take an ibuprofen and you chew it up, it has interesting taste in your mouth. But when you swallow it, it strongly burns your throat. Um, and it turns out this burn is the same burn that uh, extra virgin olive oil has. And this led to the hypothesis that perhaps extra virgin olive oil has something in it that is an, a natural anti-inflammatory compound. And perhaps this could help explain uh, the, some of the benefits of the uh, uh, Mediterranean diet. So this is, the, this is the scorecard for the European uh, uh, evaluation of, uh, of extra virgin olive oils. You can't see it, I'm sure. So the top part is, neg is negative things, and there's a lot more negative than there are positive. It goes along with my earlier thing about how negative is more important than positive. But if we look closely at the positive ones, you see the fruity odor, but then you see bitter and pungent. And pungent is the description, the word that's used for this, this throat irritation. So somehow or other, uh, the, the, they've come to appreciate this as a positive sign. People love it. People like it. Um, and it is, it is thought to, to really distinguish the best of, of, of the olive oils. Notice that bitter is also on there, too. So uh, it may be possible to, to change the valence of bitter uh, as well. So uh, our thoughts about this is that if you think about the, the makeup of extra virgin olive oil, you've got uh, the, the, uh, the makeup of the Mediterranean diet. You've got a lot of good things about that diet. Uh, one of them, one of the major ones, is the olive oil. Uh, and within the olive oil, there are these phenolic compounds. And then one of these is this, this compound that we identified, which we called oleocanthal, which uh, seems to be a, a natural anti-inflammatory more potent than ibuprofen. And now there's about 40 or 50 papers showing that this compound is anti-cancer, anti-Alzheimer's uh, uh, disease, and uh, has other, other benefits as well. So, so but it's, the, the, for the point here is, we have something that is inherently negative, and yet uh, uh, whole cultures have come to transform that into something that's positive. And my argument would be that probably that transformation requires some very early exposure. And talking to people, and this is totally anecdote, in, 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 in the Mediterranean area, many, many, many people, uh, their grandmothers would give them a little cup of olive oil to drink every morning. Uh, when they were young, uh, uh, before they went to school. And so there's this very early exposure to, to this irritant, which then becomes uh, an attractant. So rather than uh, the good going to the bad, what I've argued is that the bad can go to the good if, it's, if the timing is correct. And I've tried to make the argument that the timing early in life 
is perhaps most important uh, and most potent. So if you go back to my original um, uh, title, uh, um, we are what, the, 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 this is obviously a takeoff on you are what you eat, um, but you eat what you are. Uh, and what you are depends upon partially your genetic background. Uh, I haven't talked about individual differences so much, but these, these uh, tyre receptors, the bitter receptors, there's almost no variation amongst people in these, maybe showing how important they are. Um, but experience can overcome that. And so the, 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 the idea that, that uh, what, what we become, how we approach a food, depends not on both our genes and on our experience, and that the early experience is uh, particularly important. Um, I don't know, do I have one, have one more? One, this is my last slide, uh, and this is, this is uh, perhaps my favorite anecdote of all. Um, uh, this was told to me by uh, a woman named Liz Rosin. Uh, many of you know the name Paul Rosin. This was uh, Paul's first wife. Um, she died recently, but she was a remarkable woman who wrote cookbooks and was a very strong collaborator of Paul's. Um, and both Paul and, and, and Liz were um, wonderful people. And um, when uh, the U.S. Uh, got out of Vietnam, um, Many of the Vietnamese that were on our side, at least some of them, were taken from Vietnam and brought to a place called Fort Indian Gap in Pennsylvania. Uh, so these were people that were Vietnamese that lived all their lives in Vietnam and all of a sudden found themselves in the middle of Pennsylvania. And uh, a number of people adopted some of these kids and, and, and Liz and Paul adopted uh, uh, a teenager. So this was a, a person who spoke no English at the time, uh, had never been outside Vietnam. Um, and he describes coming to Paul Rosin's house and, and Liz Rosin's house to, for the first time. This was the person that was going to adopt them. And uh, this is later on, of course. And, and he describes how terrified he was of this. Um, you know, he's, he's in, uh, the, the, the Rosin's house, it was a huge house. It was kind of like out of, uh, out of a TV thing. It was dark at night. And he was brought there. And uh, he came and knocked on the door. And he said he was shaking. He opened the door, and all of a sudden, the smell of Vietnamese food came to him. And he said, I suddenly knew everything would be OK. Uh, and basically, what Liz Rosin did, she, her interest was in uh, flavors uh, in different cultures. And so she, knowing this, had prepared a huge array of Vietnamese foods directly uh, to, to welcome this this child. And, and so basically, th this uh, to me is the anecdote uh, that illustrates the, the profound power of the smells and flavors of foods we're used to and how they can uh, go uh, deeply, deeply into, uh, into emotion, uh, uh, which we know is closely connected to brain activity. So with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>